Okay, so it's 11.30 on my computer. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation today on understanding snoring. Why do we snore and what can we do about it? My name is Alana and I work in community health at Baptist Health South Florida. This presentation is a webinar style, so if you have any questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll answer your questions as they come. Baptist Health offers a variety of free virtual exercise classes and programs, and for our weekly schedule, please visit our website at events.baptisthealth.net, and I put that website in the chat box for you. And with that being said, I would like to now welcome our speaker today, Dr. Timothy Grant. Welcome, Dr. Grant. How are you? Oh, I'm very good. Happy to be here today. Thank you. So let's, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Timothy Grant. I'm a neurologist, but my specialty is sleep medicine. So all I really do is sleep medicine and the things we're going to talk about today. About a month ago, I gave a, a telehealth uh, talk like this on general sleep disorders and all the different things we see in the sleep lab. And I'm going to talk about that today a little bit. But because they asked me to talk primarily about snoring, I'm going to direct the talk to that. But I'm pretty informal too. So if you have questions, feel free to direct them uh, to our host and I'll try to answer them. I'm not in a rush, so I'll stick around afterwards to answer your questions as well. And uh, thank you for being here today. So let's go ahead and get started. So here's a picture. This is an actual, this is not the actual person, but it's an actual case that I had that this woman actually was being strangled in the middle of the night by her husband. And I'm going to talk a little bit later of how the heck this can be related to snoring, but it can be. So anyway, so that's why I call this the case of, listen, honey, all I did was tell you that you're snoring, and why did I wake up with you strangling me in the middle of the night? So let's go ahead, and we're going to talk about different things. So generally, when we talk about snoring, for me as a sleep doctor, it's under the category of sleep-related breathing disorders. So there's a whole spectrum. So let's talk about that a little bit. So let's say if I saw a patient like this, would I think that he had a little trouble with breathing? Well, I think he probably would. He would have problems with snoring probably and maybe some other things things as well. So we'll talk about this kind of snoring a little bit and then we'll talk about this. So here's a patient who ends up having sleep apnea and we're going to talk about the difference between those. So it turns out that sleep-related breathing disorders is a whole spectrum. On the one hand, there's snoring and then if you go to the other side, there's obstructive sleep apnea. So if you just have snoring, it's just annoying. It's not really dangerous. It's not really going to be dangerous to your health per se, we don't think right now. But if you have sleep apnea, that could be very dangerous. And one of the problems with people is they think they can tell the difference just by listening or hearing or their wife or their husband telling them what they're seeing. And you really can't. Both of them can look like each other and you can have both together. So it's a whole spectrum of disease. So here we have uh, a case of, of a slender young woman who can have snoring, but can also have sleep apnea. And here we have the sumo wrestler, the, the morbidly obese patient who you may see sitting in a chair next to you at the doctor's office or at the airport, and he's slumped over and asleep and snoring. And you say, oh my gosh, he may have sleep apnea, but you know what, she may as well. I had a case recently where a woman came to see me and she had been on an airplane. This was long before the coronavirus last year. And she said to me, hey, I was, I was sitting on an airplane on my way back home and next to me was a doctor. And I said to him, hey, listen, my husband says that I snore a little bit. You think I could have sleep apnea? And the doctor said to her, a doctor, an MD said to her, hey, listen, you cannot have sleep apnea because you're a woman, because you're slender and petite. So listen, you don't have sleep apnea. And he was completely wrong. She ended up having severe sleep apnea and she looked just like, just like this. So let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide here. And let's talk about some pearls to remember. I'm going to go through these now, and then I'm going to go through them again, all through the whole slide. And you'll see that they're very, very powerful statements that maybe you didn't realize before. So snoring can be from what we call the upper airway. And the upper airway is your nose. If you can all see me, here's your nose. And that's what we call upper airway. And that's a kind of old-fashioned snoring. It snorts and 
it snorts, it's just the upper airway. It's a deviated septum. It's from turbinates that are large inside your nasal airway. It's from allergies, it's from congestion, but that's not dangerous. It just makes a lot of noise. And if that's it, it's not going to be something that you have to say, oh my gosh, that's really dangerous. There are a lot of things that we can do about it. And I'll tell you about that in a little while, but that's not as dangerous as other things that we see. So let's go a little bit further. If you have snoring that's because the back of your airway is closing off, and that could be obstructive sleep apnea. And that could be very dangerous. And we'll talk about that. But what does that mean? We're going to talk about that over and over throughout this talk. That means that the back of your airway is closing off and the snoring's coming from the back of your throat as well as your nose, maybe. And that's what can be dangerous. So this is a very important uh, thing. I'll have patients come to me and they'll say, hey, I can't have snoring. My wife said my snoring disappears. I lost weight. We got one of those beds that elevates a little bit and my snoring has disappeared. There's no way I can have sleep apnea. And again, you can absolutely have sleep apnea with absolutely zero snoring. So the classic is a lot of snoring, but you can have it without snoring. So here we go for a couple of more pearls. It turns out that you think that, oh my gosh, you gotta be overweight, you gotta be snoring, you gotta look like the classic stereotype. But it actually turns out a third of the patients who have sleep apnea are not overweight. I'm not overweight and I don't, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't have any of those different uh, risk factors, but I have a little bit of sleep apnea. So a third of the patients can have sleep apnea, including women. It turns out that women can present in a much more subtle uh, presentation than men. And they can still have sleep apnea, especially after menopause. So just like heart disease, women tend to have less of it earlier in, in the stage of their life. And then after menopause, they start to have more and more and more, and they approach the risk factors of men. So they can have more and more sleep apnea after menopause. So here's a little bit more. This is very important. So let me explain to you what this means. So the consequences of sleep apnea, that means closing off the back of your throat, not getting enough air into your lungs, not getting enough oxygen into your brain and your brain says hey 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 come on you've got to breathe you've got to breathe so we now know that the consequences of sleep apnea are not just from a low oxygen they're also from this arousal that stimulates you to start breathing again and what is that arousal well we're going to talk about that a little bit so many years ago i i have been giving lectures at baptist hospital i've been the head of of sleep education at baptist this hospital for literally over 30 years. And I had a doctor many, many years ago say to me, hey, I don't understand it. Why do we have to treat sleep apnea if the patient's oxygens aren't going low? And I'm going to explain to you why. So one of the reasons why we want to treat sleep apnea is because your oxygen can go low. But the other reason is, hey, your brain says you've got to start breathing. And there are different forms of your nervous system. There's a nervous system that's just kind of a more relaxed nervous system. And there's, there's a part of your nervous system that reacts like when you're frightened. It's called the flight or fright response. So what happens when you're not breathing, your brain gives you that battery jolt of the sympathetic nervous system to start breathing again. And we're going to talk about why that is so dangerous. It can trigger heart disease and high blood pressure and heart attacks and all kinds of different things. So let's go a little bit further. We talked about the sympathetic tone. It's just like being frightened. So imagine all night long, not just that you're snoring from your upper airway, but you're snoring because at back of your airway is closing off and your brain is giving you these impulses all night long. That's as if somebody's shaking you in the middle of the night all night long. Okay, so let's go a little bit further and let's talk about some other things. So if you have difficult to control high blood pressure or atrial fibrillation, we're gonna talk about these things a little bit more in length as we go ahead. But high blood pressure, that's hypertension, HTN means hypertension, high blood pressure, is definitely one of the major risk factors associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And often I see patients who are referred to me from multiple doctors, either their primary doctor or their cardiologist. They say, gee, we've tried, we've tried, we've tried. The patient's losing weight. I've got them on multiple different heart medications and high blood pressure medications. I just cannot control their blood pressure. Do you think they have sleep apnea? And that's why they're sent to me. And interestingly, once we identify that they can have sleep apnea and we treat it effectively, then their blood pressure is much more well controlled. And we'll talk about that as we go on. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat. So normally your heart beats boom, 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 boom. That's the way that your heart beats. When atrial fibrillation means that you beat boom, 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 
boom, boom, and then it wiggles a little bit. And why that's dangerous is it can allow your blood to stick around in your heart a little bit longer and form a blood clot. And that blood clot can give you a heart attack or a stroke. And that's very much associated with sleep apnea as well. So these are reasons, some of the reasons why it's so important for us to distinguish, gosh, is it not a worrisome snoring or is it a worrisome snoring? So let's go a little bit further. So it turns out that when you treat uh, sleep disordered breathing, especially sleep apnea, patients do much better. They have increased survival. They do very much better. They have a longer lifespan and, and their quality of life is much better. So let's talk about common sleep disorders. I talked about this about a month ago. So I'm gonna tell you different things that I see as a sleep doctor in my office and in the laboratory every single day. And the reason that it's important to talk about all these different sleep disorders is they can all be related to snoring and all be related to sleep apnea. So let's go through them a little bit. So insomnia boy what is insomnia trouble getting to sleep trouble staying asleep getting up too early in the morning not being able to get back to sleep feeling unrefreshed well it's very very common to have insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea in fact if you think about it if those brain arousals to jerk you to start breathing in the middle of the night are waking you up it can look just like insomnia you can wake up and not even realize why you were waking up so insomnia is very 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 common to be associated with sleep apnea and often we have to treat both. So here's another thing, restless leg syndrome. So what is restless leg syndrome? It's that creepy, crawly feeling in your legs. You feel this irresistible urge to move. It's worse at night before you go to sleep. And you feel better if you stretch and move around. And that can be associated with multiple disorders as well. Parasomnias. What is a parasomnia? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit more. Para, P-A-R-A, -A, means around. So insomnia means sleep. So para around sleep are these disorders that occur in or around sleep that you don't want to be happening. And the classic example is sleepwalking. But I'm gonna tell you how it can be much more dangerous things as that, that woman getting strangled. I just had a patient yesterday, literally a young patient who's getting up in the middle of the night, he's sleepwalking, he dreamt that there was a drone. This is, <laughs> this is interesting. The classic story of somebody having a, a, a violent parasomnia is somebody's attacking them and they're fighting them. But I had a patient yesterday who's a young patient and his modern version is there was a drone like you see in a science fiction movie and the drone was flying over the bed in his bedroom and he threw his pillow at it and it turned out to be the ceiling fan. And so that was his behavior. And it turns out that that was being triggered by sleep apnea as well. So we're going to talk about parasomnia, sleepwalking and other kinds of abnormal activities during the night. Well, let's, we're going to talk about narcolepsy too. What's narcolepsy? Well, narcolepsy is not just this cartoonish thing where you just keel over and you fall asleep. It's associated with a lot of other things. And we think it's, it's because your brain is not making enough of a particular chemical to keep you awake during the day. So it's not because you did anything wrong. It's because something's going on inside of your brain. And we're not exactly sure of why that happens. But it can make you not just very sleepy, but it can make you do kind of strange things at night, like waking up in the middle of the night and feeling paralyzed. You can have hallucinations at night and have funny episodes during the day other than just feeling sleepy. And let's, we're going to go into sleep apnea. So here's, here's a nice, I love this slide. So very often, I'll have a husband and a wife sitting in the office with me together. And I'll say, classically, I'm seeing the husband. And I'll say, hey, do you snore? And he says, well, I don't know, maybe once in a while, a little bit. And the wife will say, what are you nuts? Are you crazy? You snore like a, like a lion. I can't even stand sleeping in the same bedroom anymore. I can hear you from the garage when I come in. And I can hear you all the way from the bedroom. So anyway, so we're going to talk about sleep apnea as well as general snoring. So it turns out that, again, these are a review of the different sleep disorders that I see. Sleep apnea, we talked about, insomnia, leg movements, restless leg syndrome, REM sleep behavior disorder. That's rapid eye movement sleep. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. That means the deepest sleep of when you're dreaming, rapid eye movement sleep. And that means you're doing something in your sleep that you really should not be doing. And narcolepsy, we talked about that. Circadian rhythm irregularities, that's just a fancy schmancy term for things that are associated with the time of night and the time of day. So a classic circadian rhythm disorder would be jet lag. You go from here to Europe and they're in a different time zone. So your brain's all mixed up because you're used to going to sleep in Miami, but now you're in Paris and your brain gets mixed up at what time you should go to sleep. So that's a classic. Now, another classic example is shift work. So if you think about all of our frontline workers now, my daughter's doing it, my son's doing it. If you think about 
frontline workers working in the hospitals every day, if you're working a shift, an early morning shift, a late afternoon shift, a night shift, that can wreak havoc on your what we call circadian rhythm because your brain is sensing that, gee, you should be asleep now. You shouldn't be awake in the middle of the night working. You should be asleep. And that can be a real problem as well. So let's go here a little bit further. So why do we worry about these disorders? Why do we worry about snoring? Why do we worry that it's distinguished from something more serious? Well, it turns out that these things, all of these different disorders that I've told you about, insomnia, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, all these things can be associated with different medical disorders like cardiovascular disease, like a heart attack. Like me, I have heart disease. I had to have emergency open heart surgery many, many years ago when I was younger and I have a little bit of sleep apnea. So that's a risk factor. My father had it and, and his father had it. It's, it's kind of a hereditary thing, but it's definitely associated. High blood pressure, we talked about that, but look at this long list. Gastroesophageal reflux. If you just have reflux, that's associated with sleep apnea. Diabetes, uh, psychiatric disease, kidney disease, arthritis, psychiatric disease, depression, all of these things are associated with sleep disorders. So what are these lessons learned? So we now know that multiple sleep disorders can occur at the same time. You know, when you go to medical school, they try to teach you, hey, try to lump everything into one disease, and then you treat that disease and everybody gets better. Well, it turns out in sleep medicine, it's very common to have multiple sleep disorders at the same time. And you have to treat each of them and treat each of them in the right way. So they can look like each other and you have to treat them appropriately. So we talked about it. You can have sleep apnea and insomnia, sleep apnea and narcolepsy, sleep apnea with all these different things. So this last, I see this all the time, the last thing that just popped up. I see patients all the time with all of these things at the same time. They're snoring, they stop breathing, their legs are driving them nuts, they're going crazy, they can't go to sleep in the middle of the night or they wake up in the middle of the night, they're sleepy during the daytime and they're doing some wacky things at night, just like the patient I told you about yesterday. And young, not old, he was a young guy in his 20s. Okay, so let's go. When is the sleep study indicated? When should you go to the sleep doctor? And when should you have a sleep study? Well, it turns out that if you have sleep apnea, the only way that we can tell if you have sleep apnea is to do a sleep study. You cannot tell just by listening. You cannot tell just by doing a recording. That helps me. So if the wife or the husband brings in a recording and I hear it and I can tell that the patient stops breathing, I can say, gee, I think it sounds like they have sleep apnea. But if everything looks normal, they still may have sleep apnea. So the only way you can actually definitively determine between the two is to do a sleep study periodic limb movements. That means that you're jerking in the middle of the night, you don't know that it's happening, and it's arousing you in the middle of the night. And again, the classic story is the wife is saying, hey, he's driving me nuts, he's jerking his legs all over the place in the middle of the night. And there are ways that we can treat all these things effectively. So potentially injurious nocturnal parasomnia. So remember, we talked about a parasomnia is doing something abnormal at night, and that can be potentially dangerous. So here's an example of this young patient I saw yesterday. When he's going on, he's going back to college uh, in a couple of months. So depending on the virus. But let's say he goes back to college and he's sleepwalking. He's still sleepwalking. Well, he could be sleepwalking and walk off of his balcony. He could be sleepwalking and walk out into the middle of the street. He could be doing something dangerous that could hurt him. He could fall out of bed and break a bone. So all of these things are potentially dangerous. And that's another reason to do a sleep study. Another reason is to do it if you have a seizure disorder. Now, this last thing, a precursor means doing something before and before an MSLT. And an MSLT is a daytime test that we do to tell how sleepy people are. So if you think of me as a sleep doctor, I see people all the time. They say, hey, I can't sleep well at night or I'm too sleepy during the daytime. So if you think about that, one of the things that I see all the time is I, I see pilots, I see bus drivers, I see metro rail drivers, I see, uh, Miami is the largest seaport uh, for, ocean, for cruises in the world, next to, I think, Barcelona. And uh, I see patients all the time who are, who are captains of, of, of large ships, and I have to prove that they can stay awake during the daytime, including a pilot. You don't want your pilot falling asleep in the, in the middle of flying, so if they have sleep apnea, I have to prove that they can stay awake. And there are very specific tests that we do uh, to show that they can stay awake during the day. And not just that they look like they're awake, but their brain is staying awake.
So one of the other things we do is we do a sleep study at night right before we do a daytime study to see how sleepy somebody is during the daytime. Now, these are reasons that we don't do a sleep study. We don't do a sleep study if somebody just has insomnia. You know, if somebody says to me, gee, I keep waking up in the middle of the night. I have no reason why I'm waking up. I'm just asleep. I'm, I'm awake for several hours. I can't go back to sleep. What the heck is it going to do me to do a sleep study and just watch them be awake all night long? So that's not an indication to do a sleep study. Some doctors do, but most sleep doctors don't just do a sleep study if you only have insomnia. If you say you have insomnia, but gee, you're snoring and you have heart disease and high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation, then maybe that's a good idea. But if you just say, I can't sleep at night, then maybe we would just address the insomnia first, or if you just have restless leg syndrome. Okay, let's talk about sleep uh, architecture a little bit. This I like to talk about in every lecture that I give because it's very important to understand what happens when you go to sleep. So let's talk about sleep architecture. So this is a slide. If you look at the left-hand side of the slide, that's when you start to go to sleep. And then as you drift off towards the right-hand side of the slide, that's later in the night. So if you look at these red things at the top, that's called rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep is your deepest sleep. And as you can see there, there's less rapid eye movement sleep at the beginning of the night. And as you go further on in the night, you have more deep sleep. You have more rapid eye movement sleep. So if you look at the beginning of the night, you have more of what we call slow wave sleep. That's when you're getting drowsy, you're going into deeper and deeper sleep. And then as you go towards the rest of the night, you have more of that REM, that rapid eye movement sleep. And so rapid eye movement sleep, you'll be dreaming more right before you get up in the morning. Now, a lot of people don't remember their dreams. That makes no difference whatsoever. But when we do a study on them, even people who think they're not dreaming, if we wake them up in REM sleep, they'll remember their dream. So let's see what the difference is. So most people, if you, if you were having a family get together and you said, hey, what do you think happens when you go to sleep? Well, people would say, hey, you know, you go to sleep, your brain gets tired, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning. But really, that's not what happens at all. Your brain, in some ways, is much more active when you go to sleep. You use much more glucose, much more sugar at night when you're asleep. You use more oxygen when you're asleep. Some people think your brain is actually doing much, much more in the middle of the night than it's doing uh, during the attack time. You're getting rid of all your toxins, all those bad things. You're organizing your memories and what you learned. Now look at this. This is interesting. So if you look at this, this is the beginning of sleep. This is when you're awake and you're just drowsing off. Look how active that is. Boom, 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 boom. That means your brain is very active. Those brain electrical impulses are very, very active. And then you come down to the, to the lower sleep here you go into deeper sleep, slow wave sleep, slow wave, and look at this REM sleep. If you look at REM sleep, they call it paradoxical sleep because in many ways, it kind of looks like when you're awake because your brain is very active again. So let's go back and let's talk about it. Let's talk about the beginning of the night and slow wave sleep. Well, if you're in the first part of the night, you have more slow wave sleep and you have more you're more hemodynamically stable because you have that part of the nervous system I was talking about that's more calm, it's more relaxed. You're in slow wave sleep, you're kind of more relaxed and you're more hemodynamically stable. And hemodynamically stable means that your blood pressure, your pulse, your breathing, all that stuff is gonna be more calm and more relaxed. You're kind of gonna dip your blood pressure People that go to sleep, their blood pressure drops. And that makes sense. If you're more relaxed, your blood pressure is going to go down. One of the things that we see that's very dangerous is people have sleep apnea. They're getting all these arousals and it pops their blood pressure up. So let's see what happens later in the night. So here we go back later in the night. You have more of that REM sleep. Remember the beginning of the night, you have more slow wave sleep. The end of the night, you have more REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. So what's happening there? You have more rapid eye movement sleep and your sleep apnea is worse. Why is your sleep apnea worse? Because you're more relaxed. It turns out that when you go into REM sleep, your brain is actually paralyzed. Your body is paralyzed, rather, and your muscles are paralyzed. So you can breathe, and you can move your eyes, and your heart is beating, but you don't move your muscles. People think that you can move, but you can't, because we only, we only dream for short periods at a time, and you don't want to be dreaming that you're jumping out of bed and fighting somebody and actually jump out of bed and smash your head against the wall. You want to just dream the dream and not act out the dream. So that's what happens in REM sleep. Your body's paralyzed. So if you're paralyzed, you're more likely to close off the back of your throat. You're going to start, you're going to keep having your your uh, heart beating, you're able to move your eyes, but you can close off your throat, which can be very dangerous. So now this is important. You have more sympathetic tone. 
So sympathetic tone is that fight or flight. Remember I told you that's the part of the nervous system that's, that's much more aggressive. It's boom, you got to breathe. Boom, you got to breathe. And that makes you hemodynamically unstable. So what does hemodynamically unstable mean? It means that your blood pressure is up, your heart rate is up, your breathing is up, and you're much more likely to have a heart attack, to have a stroke, to have all, all kinds of terrible things happen to you in that latter part of the night. So let's go a little bit further. So if you look here, here's sleep apnea. Here, oh, this is, my son has this, this type of dog. This is a bulldog. So a bulldog turns out to have to be the perfect example of sleep apnea. I don't know if you've ever seen a bulldog, but they just snort and gasp all the time. That's all they do because the back of their throat is so closed off. They're obese. They have, a, they have a whole bunch of tissue around their neck, and they're much more likely to close off their throat. So now let's talk about this a little bit. So if you've ever known anybody who's had a sleep study, they get a report that includes a whole bunch of different things, not just their oxygen level and not just their heart rate and not just all those different things, but it includes a thing called an AHI. And an AHI is an apnea hypopnea index. And an apnea means you stopped breathing. You literally stopped breathing for 10 seconds. In order to count that, you have to stop breathing for one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 10 seconds. That's a long time. If you think about it, to count one of those, you have to stop breathing for 10 seconds. And a hypopnea is a shallow breath. That means you, sh you, you don't stop breathing, but it's shallow enough to lower your oxygen and to cause all these other problems. And an index means you add all those things up together, and how many did you have in an hour? So when I see a report and I see that somebody had uh, an AHI, an apnea high index, they stop breathing, they have shallow breathing, more than five times in an hour, that's abnormal. And that's called mild sleep apnea. If somebody stops breathing 30 times in an hour, that's considered severe sleep apnea. So let's see, what does that mean? Let's think if there's 60 minutes in an hour, okay, so 60 minutes in an hour, if you stopped breathing 30 times an hour, that'd be every two minutes, because you get it, 30 times two is 60. So if you've got an AHI of 30, that means that you stop breathing every two minutes. If you stop breathing 60 times an hour, that means you stop breathing every minute. I see this all the time. I'm gonna show you a bunch of cases where people stop breathing every 30 seconds. So this is very, very serious. And this is the stuff I see all the time that people may not even be aware that's happening. So it turns out that twice as many men have sleep apnea as women. If you look at people with no symptoms whatsoever, it's much more men than women. But again, women tend to be much more after menopause. If you look at people with symptoms, that means they actually know they're snoring, they're gasping, they're choking, when they stop breathing, they're tired during the daytime. Then it turns out to be almost exactly twice as many men as women. But again, that's before menopause. So let's look at this. This is, this is scary. I'm 68 years old. So you think about this. Look at this. If you have an AHI greater than 20, so an AHI of 20, there's 60 minutes in an hour, an AHI of 20 would be every minute you stopped breathing. Look at that. Up to 51% of men over 65 can have sleep apnea with an AHI greater than 20. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. That's half, that's half of men. That's a lot. So this is what I ask my patients. Hey, What's happening? I ask the patient or hopefully the bed partners that's there. Are you snoring? Are you gasping? Are you choking? Do you stop breathing? That's very important stuff for me to hear. Do you have abnormal leg movements? Are you doing something violent? Are you punching? Are you grabbing? Are you doing something weird in the middle of the night? Are you sleepy during the daytime? But this is what's really important to me as well. Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? Do you have coronary artery disease? Do you have cerebral vascular disease, a stroke, anything like that? That's all really, really, really big risk factors that, oh my gosh, I've got to look for sleep apnea because you could have it. So obstructive sleep apnea can have a whole bunch of different of things associated with it. Obviously snoring, obviously excessive daytime sleepiness, the gasping, the choking. People can have memory problems. I have a patient who's in her 90s who literally was not speaking, had no communication skills whatsoever, could not do anything except doze off and her face would literally almost fall into her oatmeal. We treated her sleep apnea. You'd say, oh my gosh, you know, sleep apnea is not going to work for somebody that old. And she obviously didn't get back to the way that she is 29, but now she's speaking, she's coherent, she can kind of uh, communicate with her family. Like, unbelievable. My dad is 91. He has sleep apnea and he uses CPAP. 
You can have headaches, you can have confusion. This is a big thing, impotence. So for men, that tends to be a big thing, you know, sexual dysfunction. I just read an article that, that young men can have sexual infertility associated with sleep apnea. And that's because hormones, growth hormone and testosterone, can be associated with not sleeping well at night. Look at these last two, flappy eyelids and edema. You can have leg edema, that means swelling, and you can have flappy eyelids. Okay, so let's look at this. These are predictive things of why maybe you may have sleep apnea if you're obese, but remember, you don't have to be obese. If you're male, but you can still have it if you're female. If you're aged, but interestingly, you can have two of my grandchildren have sleep apnea. We'll talk about that a little bit, why it's different in children. So you can have it in childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, and as you get older, it tends to be more common as you get older, but you can have it at any age and any sex. Uh, if you've got a family history, it's interesting. I just told you about somebody this week that I had. His father and his mother both have sleep apnea. So here's another risk factor. So you know in neck circumference, so like I'm wearing a neck collar here of 16 and a half inches. That's me. So that's what we mean by a neck circumference. So in men, a risk factor is if their neck circumference is over 17 inches, that's a risk factor. In women, if it's over 16 inches, like I make it blue and pink there, that's what I did there. So anyway, and facial anatomy. So if you have a large jaw or if your jaw is receding, like what we call a receding jawline, that makes it more likely to close off your throat and if you have excessive daytime sleepiness. So why do we treat sleep? Why do we want to treat sleep apnea and snoring? What's the big deal? Well, we want to improve people sleeping at night. We want to make, have them awaken feeling more refreshed. We want them to be less sleepy during the daytime. But this is what's important about sleep apnea and why it's important to distinguish between the two. So if you look at everything on the left-hand side of this slide, these are the classic things that are associated with sleep apnea. Hypertension, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, cerebrovascular disease is a stroke, diabetes, depression, re renal disease means kidney disease. And look at these things. Now it turns out that sleep apnea is considered a risk factor for every single form of cancer. And we now believe that the reason for that is these constant arousals, that boom, 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 that gets you to wake up during the night can, can affect your immune system and it can affect your immune system to be able to fight off cancers. So this is interesting. In the lecture I gave last, last month, there, was, there were articles out that people were saying, hey, should I use my CPAP, my sleep apnea treatment, if, I, if there's a coronavirus around? Should I? And yes, you absolutely should, because it's gonna help your immune system to even help fight off the coronavirus and help you recover. So that was a big question. The other thing is sexual function. Sexual function we just talked about of impotence, infertility, and look at this Alzheimer's disease. It's now considered a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And that makes sense. So if you're having these arousals or you're having uh, decreased oxygen to your brain night after night after night, that's an important thing. And it's also a thing that the way that we clean out toxins, these abnormal substances from the brain is in deep sleep and REM sleep. And if you have these constant arousals, you're not cleaning out these toxins, these bad things from your brain. And those are some of the things that lead to Alzheimer's disease. So that's why it's considered a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Look at this psoriasis. Everybody, every other commercial on TV is for a psoriasis medicine now. But sleep apnea is considered a risk factor for psoriasis as well. And that's because of the, immu the immune system. And glaucoma. So eye disease, who would think it's associated with glaucoma? I get, re I get referrals all the time now from Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, you know, our most famous eye institute uh, down uh, at the university. Uh, people who have a coma that's difficult to control and I, I find out that they have sleep apnea in hopes that we're going to help their glaucoma. So here we go. Let's look at this. Cardiac-related cardiac sequela from sleep apnea. So again, we talked about snoring the upper airway. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. Let's talk about what are some of the heart-related problems associated with sleep apnea. So remember, what is sleep apnea? You're going into sleep. As you go into deeper and deeper sleep, your throat becomes so relaxed that it closes off like a king toes. So the snoring's coming from back here. So that's where it is. It's back there. So look at this. This is a sleep study. This tells you what I, what I and my sleep technicians do every night. So look at this. All night long, they're looking at all these different levels. So each one of these things is a different activity. It's brainwave activity. It's how your chest is moving, how your oxygen is moving. And uh, if you look here, this is your breathing. 
you know, you can look at that, that slow breathing, you're breathing, you're breathing, you're breathing, and here you're breathing, you're breathing. This is a normal sleep study. Somebody has normal breathing, those boom, boom, boom things at the top, those red things are the heart rate, it's regular, and you have regular breathing. If you think about somebody who's breathing, they have regular breathing and regular. Now let's look what happens with sleep apnea. So here somebody is snoring. So there's their snoring. And look what happens. Now they stop snoring, okay? So they've stopped snoring. And here you can tell, not only did they stop snoring, they stopped breathing. So see right before that was those little bumps where they were breathing. Now they've stopped breathing. So they're not only stopped snoring, but they've stopped breathing. And that's what's dangerous. Okay, so let's go that. So what's associated with heart disease? Well, you can have a heart attack. You can have an irregular heart beat, like atrial fibrillation. So remember, we talked about atrial fibrillation. It's this irregular heartbeat. Your, your, your heart doesn't beat in that regular way. It's, it's, it's jiggling around a little bit. And why is that important? So even for a millisecond, a couple of seconds, or even that short period of time that your blood sticks around in your heart, remember we talked about that it can form a clot. And then that clot can give you a stroke or a heart attack. Well, it turns out that a third of those patients are associated with sleep apnea. So the big thing in the literature now is, oh my gosh, if you have atrial fibrillation, you've got to go ahead and try to see if the patient has sleep apnea. Because they turn out to do much, much, they do twice as well in the long run if you treat their sleep apnea compared to if they didn't treat it. That means that if if you, if you have atrial fibrillation and you treat the sleep apnea, you're twice as likely to do well, twice as likely not to have recurrent atrial fibrillation, and twice as likely that if you have to have a procedure like cardioversion, where they shock the heart back into regular rhythm, to be successful. And then look at this uh, of high blood pressure. It turns out that half of the patients with high blood pressure have sleep apnea, and half of the patients with sleep apnea have high blood pressure. And we talked about how important that is. All the literature now says that if you treat sleep apnea, you're much more likely to have a much more favorable response to your high blood pressure. Okay, so this is a thing called metabolic syndrome. And if you've never heard of that, it's a syndrome associated with high blood pressure, that's hypertension. Glucose intolerance means diabetes. Hyperlipidemia means a high cholesterol or triglycerides, and you're obese. So high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol or triglycerides, and you're obese and you're obese. That's called a metabolic syndrome, if you've ever heard your doctors talk about that. Well, it's a big thing that we talk about. But now look at this. There is a syndrome that actually exists called Syndrome Z, Z like in zebra. And it's the metabolic syndrome plus sleep apnea. Because remember I told you, sleep apnea is associated with all of those things. So it's so common that they came up with a syndrome to describe that. So let's talk about what are the treatment options for sleep disordered breathing. And remember, sleep disordered breathing is all the way from snoring to sleep apnea. So let's talk about snoring a little bit. So what are the general considerations for snoring? Well, it turns out that if you're overweight, you're more likely to snore. So it turns out that it's a good thing because in, sleep, in snoring, commonly it's associated with either your airway closing off a little bit or you have vibration in the back of your airway, either your upper airway and, and, uh, or the back of your throat that's causing the snoring but not sleep apnea. So losing weight is a good thing. Remember, you can, you can have problems even a third of the weight, but losing weight. And, and often you'll hear uh, a spouse say, hey, you know, when my husband lost weight or when my wife lost weight, the snoring was less. So here's another, elevate the head of the bed. So I'll tell you a funny story. So one of my relatives just said they went through all these bed things to try to figure out which bed they wanted to buy. And, you know, now you can get these loaners that they let you try out the bed. So, you know, there are these electric beds and you see the commercial where the wife raises the head of the bed and then his snoring goes away. Well, one of my relatives said it was driving him nuts because all night long he would hear, eh. <laughs> And then he would start snoring and, eh, and all night long, the head of the bed elevated was driving him insane, was, dri was waking him up all the time. Of course, maybe his snoring got a little bit better, but it was driving him crazy. So off your back. So it turns out that if you lay on your back, which we call supine, so if you're on your back, you're much more likely to close off the back of your throat just from gravity, because gravity makes it more likely for the back of your throat. That's why raising the head of the bed helps. So staying off your bed, off your back rather helps. One of the simple things we recommend is taking a t-shirt with a pocket in it. So if you have a pocket 
in the front of the t-shirt. We say, turn it around backwards so the pocket is in the back. Put a tennis ball in the pocket. And when you're laying back, it's kind of is uncomfortable. It reminds you to get off your back. They actually make a device now. It's, I think, $189 where you strap it around you. And if you lay on your back, it gives you a little vibration and reminds you to get off your back. And sometimes people like that. So avoidance of alcohol. And you've probably heard people say, gee, when my husband has a couple of drinks, he's more likely to snore. Or if you take a sedative, you're more likely to snore. So to watch those things. So oral appliance, let's talk about this. What is an oral appliance? So oral appliance is a thing, we're I'll show you some examples of that. It's in your mouth, it's not a bite plate. It's a thing that sticks in your mouth and it moves your jaw forward. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. So it actually pulls your jaw forward and by pulling your jaw forward, it opens up the back of your throat. But there are some risks with that that we'll talk about. Nasal steroids. So nasal steroids are like Flonase or, or those sorts of things where you just spray it in your nose and it opens up your airway. Nasal strips, like a breathe right nasal strips that you put a strip over your nose and it opens up your nostrils. That may help you breathe a little bit better at night. It's not going to help sleep apnea, but it could help snoring if it's just from the other upper airway. And a surgical intervention, I'm going to talk about that a little bit of when is surgery indicated for just snoring. So education, education is one of the biggest things for all of this, because remember, we can't just assume that it's just snoring. We have to say, is it snoring or is it sleep apnea or is it both? Because it's important to make sure that you're treating it in the right way. So here are some different options of how to treat uh, patients with sleep apnea in general. So general sleep hygiene, all the things we talked about, losing weight off your back, avoiding that sort of education, and safety issues regarding being sleep. And if you have edema, uh, swelling in your feet, uh, to wear a compression socket. So here's a silly picture about an oral appliance. This is not really what they look like. It's just kind of a silly picture of a guy <laughs> using his false teeth. But here we go. This is what an oral appliance is. So if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, a part goes in the top and a part goes in the bottom, and it actually pulls your jaw forward. So if you look at this, it pulls your jaw forward that, boom, it jerks your jaw forward. So if you imagine right now while you're listening to me, just move your jaw forward. If you're jutting out the lower portion of your jaw, that's what it's doing. Now, in some people, I have a handful of people who like that. But if you do that for a couple of seconds, you can feel it in your jaw. You can feel it in the side of your jaw. So in some people, they can get jaw pain, what we call TMJ or temporomandibular joint syndrome. And it can actually, if you think that all night long you're wearing your teeth in a funny position, it can actually move your teeth. So we're going to talk about that. It's important to make sure that you follow up with a dentist. So it turns out that there's over 80 of these approved by the by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, it's not good for severe. So remember I told you severe sleep apnea is if you stop breathing over 30 times an hour. It's only good for the mild and moderate. And the risk of, of, of hurting in your jaw, the need to get dental follow-up, but you have to make sure it's not moving your teeth around. And then the other thing, so people will say, remember I said you can have sleep apnea without snoring. So say you treated your sleep apnea with an oral appliance and you say, gee, my wife says my snoring has all gone away. Does that mean my sleep apnea went away? Well, it does not. I have to do another sleep study with you wearing the oral appliance to make sure that it went away. So Remember, you can have sleep apnea without snoring. Okay, so let's go a little further. So let's talk about surgery. What is a septoplasty? So in, the, in your nose, a septoplasty, you want to look like Paul Newman or have a beautiful nose. That may help snoring and airflow, but it doesn't really help sleep apnea because remember, sleep apnea is in the back of your throat. So again, one of my relatives just had septoplasty and sinus surgery because his snoring was just from the upper airway. It wasn't from, I didn't take care of him, but it was the ear, nose, and throat doctor just did that because he did not have sleep apnea. So it's just for snoring. So let's talk about this. This is called a UPPP. It's a fancy term for what's called a uvulopalatal pharyngoplasty. And that's a long word, meaning that they go in and they carve away the top of your palate in the back of your throat. It's like a rotor rooter back there. So they carve away the back of the palate. They yank away your tonsils. They actually ream it around out there. And they thought, well, heck, you know, sleep apnea is in the back of your throat. That should work. That should be great. It's in the back of your throat. It should be wonderful. But it turns out that it was horrifically painful, and the majority of those patients still ended up having sleep apnea. 
So they rarely do that anymore. Maxillomandibular advancement. This was a surgery, believe it or not, where they would cut the jaw. They would actually break your jaw and move your jaw forward and then put in like bridges in between to make your jaw jut out. And it was a very extensive procedure, extremely uncomfortable. Now, tonsillectomy, just yanking out your tonsils. You'd say, hey, I have large tonsils. Why don't you just take out my tonsils? Well, it turns out that it's very helpful in children, you can see, but it's not so helpful in a Adults. So in children, often, like my grandchildren, you yank out their tonsils, and often you can cure the sleep apnea. But in adults, you yank out the tonsils, they still have sleep apnea, because it's the difference between the size of the tonsils and the size of the throat. So here's a new device called the hypoglossal nerve stimulator. This is a new thing that's only come about in the last couple of years, and I actually participate. I'm one of the people that participates in following up the patients with this after the surgeon has put it in. And this is what it is. So it's called, it's like the simple term for it, it's like a sleep apnea pacemaker. And so this pacemaker goes into your chest, just like a heart pacemaker. And then you have a, a lead, a, a wire that goes into a part of your chest in between your ribs to sense when you're breathing. And then another wire goes up into your neck to a nerve that leads to your tongue. And it sounds kind of goofy and kind of silly, but every time you take a breath, it juts your tongue out just a little bit. And by pulling out your tongue just a little bit in some people, that can help their sleep apnea because that's what was closing off their airway. But it's very expensive, it's a surgical procedure, and it's only for a select amount of patients. Uh, but we have patients that sometimes that's what we do for them. So here's a patient with sleep apnea. So this is kind of a diagram of where sleep apnea is. Remember, it's the back of the throat that is closing off. Now look what this guy had. Remember I told you about AHI? So AHI means how many times he stops breathing in the middle of the night. Look at this, 112 times. This is not unusual for me to see. He stops breathing almost every 30 seconds. And here he gets treated and it goes down to seven. So he went from 112 times an hour of closing off his throat to seven. Then I see him in follow up, he goes from 105 times to literally zero times an hour. So that's gotta, I mean, you just think about, oh my God, your brain's waking you up 100 times an hour. How can that be good for you? Well, it's not. So here are some pearls. Sleep apnea can persist without snoring. We've talked about that. The incidence of snoring increases uh, and sleep apnea increases after menopause. Women can present more subtly. A third of the patients are not overweight. So look at this. This slide makes me laugh. So I actually use CPAP. So CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. It's just air. So if you think about it, it's just gentle air that goes through the back of your throat, keeps the back of your throat open. Air has oxygen. So it tells your brain, hey, the throat's open, air's going through, he's well oxygenated, leave him alone, stop waking him up. So I'm talking about some different options. So it turns out in the old days, all the masks were like these Darth Vader things. They were horrible. They were horrific. But we have a whole bunch of different options now. They're little tiny things that just fit in the tip. There are masks that cover your nose, masks that cover your face. They're like little Mickey Mouse masks. Now they have masks that even the tube attaches on the top of the head. And so it's not really as, as this uh, uncomfortable, inconvenient thing uh, that you that you have so here are the different devices so you think oh my god it's this big thing it's going to be like a vacuum cleaner sitting next to my bed no no it's like a little clock radio and it turns out that they're very very nice and these are they make portable units now not the portable units that would be for every day but a portable unit that you could use if you travel. So say if we start traveling again after the coronavirus kind of goes away and there's a vaccine look at look this is a person's hand and this is the size of the portable unit. So again, these aren't strong enough to use every night, but it turns out that there are a lot of different options. This is what I use when I go on an airplane when I have traveled in the past. So they're very, very effective. I've, I've even used it, as I said, when I'm flying. So here's kind of a funny thing. So I say this, listen, it's good for intimacy. It turns out that, that spouses, husbands or wives, they're actually happy when you're using CPAP because the snoring disappears. There's zero snoring. You're, you're treating your health, so you're gonna be more healthy, you're less risk of a heart attack and a stroke and diabetes, all these horrific things. Uh, and uh, gee, your spouse can sleep a little bit better now that you're not snoring. So here, gosh, you know, here's the old days, you'd sleep a lot better. Here are a little bit more common times, this was intimacy, maybe read a book or do something else. And here's Dr. Grant's way of keeping the romance alive. So I always joke with my patients, I say, hey, you know, make love before you put on the machine. And so the truth of the matter is, is other than being a little bit inconvenient, people get used to it. I tell you, I've been using it for 15 years and uh, it's helped me.
So here's heart disease and sleep apnea. So if you have untreated sleep apnea, you're more likely to literally drop dead in the middle of the night. I mean, seriously, that's a horrible thing. And you've probably read in the past about the football player that that happened to. And the reason, remember I told you, you're more unstable in the middle of the night because of uh, sleep apnea. So remember, here's sleep apnea. You stop snoring. You stop breathing. You stop breathing. Remember we talked about this before? So let's talk different irregular heartbeats that are associated with that. So you can have a slow heartbeat, a fast heartbeat, an irregular heartbeat, and the atrial fibrillation. Remember we talked about that. So let's look at that a little bit. So here is a normal, normal sleep. So here, look at that heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. And here's the, here's the heartbeat. And there it is. Boom, boom, boom. Okay? So now we go to an irregular. Uh, so, and this is a patient having uh, sleep apnea and an irregular heartbeat with, sleep, with the atrial fibrillation. Look at the green there. They're having an irregular heartbeat. So it's not going boom, 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 boom. It's all irregular. It's fluttering and, and it's irregular. And so then if you look here, there was the normal breathing. But now you see the patient was breathing here and then they stopped breathing for that whole time period all along there until they start breathing again. And that's why you can be associated with sleep apnea. Look at this. Patient has a sinus pause. So here's your heartbeat. Boom, boom, boom. So you're having your normal heartbeats, normal heartbeats, normal heartbeat, and then you pause and you don't start breathing again. You don't start beating your heart again for a little while. And that's because you stopped breathing there and then you start breathing again right after that. So it's associated with these horrific heart, uh, heart irregularities. Here you're having normal heartbeats there, boom, 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 boom. And then look at this, you have this very irregular heartbeat. It, it starts beating very fast and that puts a lot of risk on your heart. So look at that, you stopped breathing at that same time. Okay, so it turns out that between three and six million people in the United States have atrial fibrillation. It's a big risk factor, and they do worse if you don't treat it. High blood pressure, we talked about it. The higher your blood pressure, the more severe your sleep apnea, and vice versa. This is a slide. I'll just go right to the, to the crux. You're, if you have severe sleep, ap sleep apnea, you're more likely to have heart failure. If you have severe sleep apnea, you're more likely to have coronary artery disease. So here are the different CPAP treatment uh, 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 things. So it decreases those arousals. Remember those jolts to get you to start breathing. You're not going to have those anymore if you treat the sleep apnea. Remember I told you normally when you go to sleep, your blood pressure dips, it goes down, where well, you're not going to have that if you have to have this, if you have high blood pressure, you're going to be spiking. And if you have sleep apnea that's giving you that, that jolt all night long, it's going to pop your blood pressure up. We used to think that it would pop your blood pressure up just at night when you weren't breathing. But then we realized that it wasn't just rising, raising your blood pressure at night, it would raise it for the whole day. So when you treat sleep apnea, it lowers your blood pressure even during the daytime and you have a favorable response to atrial fibrillation. So now let's get back to that slide, that silly slide that I showed before that was actually real. What is a parasomnia? It's abnormal behavior in sleep at the beginning of the night. It could be sleepwalking or night terrors that you see in children. And in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, you can see nightmares, sleep paralysis. That means you wake up, you can't move. And this REM sleep behavior disorder. So remember I told you you should be paralyzed when you're dreaming? Well, some people, especially men, they can actually act out the dream. That means they're not just dreaming they're fighting somebody, they actually fight somebody and they can grab or punch their wife and say, oh my gosh, honey, I didn't mean to do that. I thought somebody was trying to attack you when I was fighting them off. So here's this funny slide I showed last week or last month. This is an actual patient that woke up in the middle of the night and he ran naked next door to borrow a cup of sugar. And it turned out that he was treating his sleep apnea, but he decided he didn't want to use it anymore. His machine broke and he didn't want to get a new machine. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and he knocks on his neighbor's door and the neighbor says, oh, hey, Charlie, nice, nice to see you. What can I do for you? And he, and he kind of wakes up after that and he realizes that he did something horrific and he comes to see me. So he was diagnosed with sleep apnea. We treated him and he had no further episodes. I didn't even need to give him a medicine. So here's that patient I showed you at the very beginning. This was a very actual patient that I saw. She wakes up and she says, oh my God, my husband's strangling me in the middle of the night, but he seems like he was totally asleep. Well, he was, and he was acting out a dream. He thought that he was saving her and she actually called 911. And uh, the nice part about this is I treat his sleep apnea and he has no further episodes. So what are the lessons we've learned? The reasons that we want to treat sleep apnea, oh, sleep apnea can trigger parasomnia. So here we go again. Okay. So why do we treat sleep apnea? It gives you a good quality of life. 
It can improve your daytime sleepiness. It can decrease motor vehicle accidents. It can improve your diabetes. It can improve your blood pressure and heart disease. It can improve your general survival. You're gonna live longer. And remember, if snoring is from the upper airway alone, it's not that worrisome, but we have to make sure that it's not sleep apnea because if it's sleep apnea, it may pose a risk. And you can have sleep apnea without snoring. A third of the patients with sleep apnea are not overweight. They can be slender and petite like the woman I showed you. Sleep apnea can pre present more subtly in women. That means they can have very soft, mild snoring and still have sleep apnea, but it gets worse after menopause. The consequences of sleep apnea are not just related to low oxygen, but those arousals. Remember I told you that sympathetic nervous system jolt, and that is the same as being frightened and jerked around all night long. Uh, if you have difficult to control high blood pressure or atrial fibrillation, look for underlying uh, sleep apnea. You have increased survival. You're going to feel better, do better, and live longer if you treat your sleep disordered breathing. So this is a nice slide that I like to end with. So laugh and the world laughs with you, snore and you sleep alone. So um, a lot of, I'm, I'm ready for, if anybody has any questions or anything, I'm happy to do that uh, for you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gray. That was an excellent, very thorough presentation. And um, yeah, we have a couple minutes left because we do have another program at 12.30. Um, but I had one question about CPAP, it asked, um, once you begin using CPAP, how long would it take for the patient's memory to improve? Is there a... Well, obviously, that's a good question. So obviously it depends. So decreased memory has diff 50 different reasons. You know, I'm a neurologist as well. So decreased memory can be from Alzheimer's. It could be from strokes. It could be from medications. It could be from depression. It can be from sleep apnea. So if you've got some other reason for your memory problem other than sleep apnea, you may not come back to normal. Um, sometimes people notice a difference very quickly within the first couple of weeks. Sometimes it can take longer, but it all depends what the, what the whole picture is. And it depends on your age. It depends what other risk factors are. Um, so again, this one example that I gave you, she had a lot of other risk factors and underlying Alzheimer's disease, but she did get better. She didn't get anywhere near normal, but she got significantly better. But the answer is how long does it take? It depends on other things. Sometimes it's days, sometimes it's weeks or longer. Perfect. Next. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then um, to kind of further elaborate, it says, does it reduce the risk of heart attacks or stroke? Absolutely. So remember I told you that I have heart disease. So my AHI, remember how many times an hour, my, my apnea hypopnea index is near normal. It's five. And I have heart disease. So I'm a big believer in this. You can see I'm a big believer that this stuff works. So I use CPAP, even though I don't have horrific sleep apnea, and I'm convinced my snoring disappears. And all the literature says that if you use sleep apnea, you're much, much, like, much less likely to have a stroke or a heart attack. Perfect. Thank Go ahead. And next. And yeah. have, um, does a neti pot decrease snoring? Uh, no. So a Medipop, it depends on what the snoring's from. So a Medipop, if you have sinus disease or congestion in your nose, so say you just have congestion in your upper airway, you have allergies or congestion, or you have a cold, and it's just from the upper airway, a Medipop may really work great. It may work terrific because it's relieving that congestion. But if you have other problems, you have a deviated septum or turbinates, or if you have sleep apnea, the Medipop alone isn't going to work. But some people love a body puck because it can help them if it's just upper airway and just from congestion or sinuses. Perfect. And one last question, just um, saying mouth breathers versus nose breathers. Is so, it more apt yeah. to snore? Who is more apt to snore? Okay. So a mouth breather, like I'm a mouth breather, but I wear a bite plate. I'm a grinder. So I wear a bite plate just to keep me from grinding my teeth. And that kind of reminds me to keep my mouth shut at night. So the only time we, it doesn't mean you're more likely to have sleep apnea if you're mouth breathing. Some people see, say, oh gosh, you're closing off your airway. So you're going to open up your mouth to get more air. And that's, that's commonly seen. We do see that, that somebody a mouth breathe, but we see people all the time who don't mouth breathe at all. Uh, People will ask the question all the time. They say, if I'm a mouth breather and I'm using CPAP, what kind of masks do I need to use? And some people will say, oh, you have to use a chin strap or you have to use a full face mask. But the answer is, we only worry about mouth breathing if number one, the mouth breathing is waking up your spouse and making so much noise that you're waking up your bed partner. Or if so much air is coming out of your mouth and not going down the back of your throat to take care of the sleep apnea, 
we worry about that. And some people, if they're mouth breathing, they have a dry mouth. But there are a lot of ways that we can address that. But the answer is, it doesn't mean that you're absolutely more likely. You can not be a mouth breather and still have sleep apnea. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Grant. And I don't mean to rush you again. We have another program at 1230, but um, we will hope to have you again. Um, we've talked about this, doing more um, sleep presentations in the future. And again, I put in our chat box, our website, where you can see the other classes that we offer, as well as free virtual classes. And is there anything else you'd like to end with, Dr. Grant? No, I'd like to just thank everybody for uh, attending, and I hope it was informational and informative and maybe a little bit entertaining. And it's, seriously, I hope it helps you that if you have somebody in your family or anybody who snores, it kind of gives you a, a pathway of how to address that and what might be best for them. So anyway, and the other thing is seriously, everybody be safe, follow the your doctor's advice and the CDC advice about all this stuff about the coronavirus. Be safe, everybody. And again, I wish everybody well. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day.